Welcome to NeuroNoodles Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology podcast featuring neurofeedback legend Jay Gunkelman and Seaburn Fisher, the author of Neurofeedback and the Treatment of Developmental Trauma, Calming the Fear-Driven Brain. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. We have a very special show today. My name is Pete, and we're going to talk about women you should know in neurofeedback. But before we get to Jay and Seaburn, we got some Patreon love to dish out. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, attend ANI's pre-conference workshop at the ISNR 2022 conference Wednesday, July 27th, between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. The workshop will concentrate on assessment and protocol preparation using the Neuro Navigator and the Symptom Checklist, which includes cerebellar ROIs and uses SW Loretta for more precise targeting and cross-frequency coupling. Training will be introduced. And hey, if you want a coupon code, email Pete at Neuronoodle.com. I'll hook you up. Learn more at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash Neuroguide. Hey, thanks to our silver supporters, Mary Tracy's awesome QEG training program at EEGstrategies.com and Mind Media's Nexus EEG Amplifier. Welcome aboard, Erwin. They're at MindMedia.com. Well, who better to talk about women and neurofeedback than Seaburn Fisher and Jay Gunkelman. Jay Gunkelman, who are some of the people that we should know? Uh, peeling back time to some of the very early days is probably a good spot to start. And uh, having kind of been around in those early days, I think one of the key people that is probably not very well known at this point is Barbara Brown. Uh, uh, she had a very... Uh, uh, a booming voice. She was an impressive presence. And uh, amongst all the guys that were trying to run things, uh, she actually was one of the people that ran things. She was a, an, an important key figure in the early days. And she worked in the area of EEG and um, actually worked on interpersonal uh, EEG experiments uh, with people sitting across from each other, seeing only their eyes through a slit. And they had to guess when the other person was making the, a similar uh, brain pattern of theta content. And uh, she had very good success uh, with individuals guessing when the other person was in the same state. Um, and, and that, you know, interpersonal EEG stuff is really not an easy area of study. And uh, she did a very good job in that area and, again, was, was key in the organizational uh, uh, early days. The early days organizational stuff, right from the very start, had Francine Butler. Fran, uh, uh, <laughs> cousin Fran, uh, uh, to, to me, I'm, I'm uh, uh, cousin Jay for her. Um, uh, but she was there in the Biofeedback Research Society, the Biofeedback Society of America, when it changed to BSA. And then uh, when Barry Sturman was uh, the head of the organization, they switched the name over to uh, Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, AAPB. But she's been, she was there. I mean, obviously she retired. Um, most, most of the people that were there at the beginning are retired like I am now. Uh, but but those, those two, I think, were uh, there at the very start and they were kind of key people uh, running uh, things at that time. And um, I, I think they're, uh, Barbara Brown is probably not as well known as Francine Butler because she's was the executive director of AAPB and BSA and, uh, and Biofeedback Research Society. Th those two uh, go back to the very, very beginning. There's a lot of key people uh, that, that are around uh, since then. One of the early biofeedback pioneers was Eleanor Criswell, who's in, she does somatic uh, uh, somatics and uh, biofeedback still. And, and uh, you know, she, she was there in the very early days uh, as well. And, uh, and uh, for, for biofeedback, she's still uh, one, one of the key uh, people in somatics. Um, uh, uh, let, let me shut up a bit and, and uh, uh, let Seaburn toss a couple names out as well. 
Well, I was thinking uh, about, I mean, there's uh, people that I didn't know. I, I haven't known about the people that you've, I've known their names, uh, but I haven't known them. And the same would be true of Alice Green, who I think has been uh, uh, a major influence in the field, particularly in the field as I am interested in it, both in the in trauma, but in the transpersonal an understanding of, of uh, what is it beyond biofeedback and so and then um, I think her daughter Pat was Pat Norris was her daughter right and um, became a uh, stepdaughter for Elmer in their marriage I think that's how that went and Pat went on to do some very important work in healing um, both uh, Elmer and Pat passed close to each other uh, in time, um, but Elmer lived to be a hundred, over a hundred, and I think, uh, in um, and uh, from what I could tell, from what Pat told me, I had met Pat. I met Pat at a conference where it may have been. Well, I, it was in Austria uh, when you were there too, and Barry Sturman was there, and um, you know, Pat was really talking about using biofeedback, not so much neurofeedback, but biofeedback as a healing modality, uh, and had written about healing and cancer. So uh, that, um, you know, and she she was just lovely. She's a, a lovely human being. Um, other people who uh, I also didn't meet, uh, but is a name that I heard right from the beginning and not, not always in the most um, agreeable circumstances, but, but as a major player in the field was Margaret Ayers. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about her since I didn't know her and came in in the midst of controversy around you know, between Margaret and the Othmers. And, but I, but we, it, that's not so important to go into, but she is definitely a woman of note. And then yes. I can talk some about some of the other people who are directing. Imagine, imagine somebody in this field having a controversy. It's right. <laughs> Oh, right. that never happened. oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> um, uh, Margaret Ayers started out uh, uh, doing tech work under Barry Sturman's uh, guidance, and uh, she basically saw the power in what he was doing, and she uh, created a device that was uh, uh, similar. I, uh, I don't think that, it, well, you, you can't really copy exactly any device, but, uh, the, you know, the 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 root of some of the controversy was uh, was you know uh, uh, she, she's taking some intellectual uh, content that she learned imagine that studying <laughs> under somebody and learning something you know right. um, but she she applied uh, her uh, feedback in uh, a lot of areas that wouldn't necessarily be commonly done including recovering people out of coma. Yeah. Uh, uh, she did very good work in that area. The detailed documentation wasn't as good as some things. I mean, you know, Glasgow Coma Scale and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff really needs to be done if you're going to uh, do coma recovery work at a at an academic level. Uh, but as a clinician, you know, you're, you're looking for results, not necessarily publications. So, you know, she was a clinician. She taught a lot of people and, and, and uh, progressed in the field uh, very nicely. Her claim about her device was that it was instantaneous feedback uh, and and real time. Uh, there's a lot of people that make that same kind of a claim now, uh, uh, but it was it, it was her uh, observation that the feedback had to be very 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 quick in order for it to be something you could relate to, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's obviously supported strongly with. Uh, standard operant principles at this point. Right. But, you know, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Elise Green and and um, the manager uh, 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 folks. And if you think of people who came out of that under her influence, you know, all of the work on addiction, uh, Peniston and Kokulski uh, and their work came out of that laboratory setting okay. and uh, uh, from, from their tradition. So, you know, I, the, the seeds that come away from the parent plant end up being uh, uh, keys to how, how you can understand what the field is like right now. Uh, the, uh, you may not have known the parent 
uh, uh, plant that seeded things into the field, but you can see their influence if you if you look at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there there are people that have been around for a long time uh, that uh, that are well known in the field. Uh, um, uh, uh, Linda and Michael Thompson, Linda Thompson, uh, clinical training uh, that that they've done across the years. They've seeded so many people into the field mm -hmm. with their uh, with their intro courses and advanced courses. Um, uh, the Stony Lake as a location, there's so many people that have that as a, a fabulous uh, recollection of their training. Linda Kirk has been around uh, since the very beginning. And again, uh, Linda Kirk is in Texas. She was the head of the, uh, uh, then I think called SSNR back in the old days, uh, mm -hmm. ISNR now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in 1998, uh, she was the president. Uh, she actually worked in Texas to get the uh, legislation that allowed TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, to receive neurofeedback. Uh, the insurance companies can't deny coverage for neurofeedback for TBI. Is, and, that still, is that still the case? Yes, that's still the case. So as you know, don't find that in any other state. This was a, a hard fought campaign uh, with good connections to state legislature. So um, yeah, that these you know, insurance stuff is fought on a state by state by state basis quite often. Nancy right. White, Nancy White's been around. Uh, the first year um, that I did uh, a, a co-chair of a meeting for then SSNR, uh, was Society for the Study of Neuronal Regulation. Uh, Nancy was on the board of directors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and she's been on certifying boards ever since. Um, the QEG certification board, uh, uh, she, she's been the head of that uh, for quite a long time now. Uh, uh, Judy Crawford, uh, uh, again, certification less, less PCIA. Yes, right, yes. If if those names have triggered anything for you, I'd, uh, I I tend to be a blabbermouth, and I'd be happy to <laughs> shut up and let you go. You know. So. Well, no, no, no. I mean, it, it, I, I, I but it's it's you're the historian in this case, and so I think it's it's very helpful to me. I mean, this isn't about a this isn't about equal representation at this moment, Jay, as it is to getting some word out about the influence that women have had. And I stand on their shoulders and sometimes I don't even know how I got there, right? I've, and so you're filling in some stuff for me, which I appreciate. I did wanna ask you if you uh, knew if uh, the work around bringing people out of comas that Margaret began has been continued in, in any area. Yeah, because I haven't heard about that. And when I read the case studies, they're well, so compelling, you know, as case studies, they're extraordinarily yeah. compelling. Uh, um, there has been work in that area. I was involved with a group, um, a, a, a corporate uh, entity, a nonprofit uh, out of the East Coast, uh, the uh, Brain Research uh, Foundation. And um, uh, Philip Defina is the, the uh, uh, PhD that runs that. And uh, we were, uh, uh, they said, first of all, uh, Philip Defina heard a talk I gave on consciousness. And he asked me, would you like to look at some EEGs on people that have recovered from coma? And I said, that's the only silly question I ever got, Jay, would you like to look at this data, you know? <laughs> um, and sure. So he sent me 12 EEG recordings on two people that, is, is, uh, that had been recovered from a coma. Excuse me, three people. And uh, so uh, 12 studies uh, times three people, but they were all QEGs. And I said, well, I'm missing step one. You have to send me the EEGs. Um, so I eventually I got uh, you know, 12 times three actual raw EEGs. And looking at the raw EEG, I could tell them in a blinded rate or fashion when the people came out of their coma, just looking at the data. They had given the same puzzle, just the cues, not the raw EGs, to lots of people. Every big name you know in the field had taken a peek at that data, but nobody could predict anything. Um, I predicted accurately. The third person actually went 
out of a coma, back into a coma and came out again. And I got that one right as well. Uh, so uh, based on the EEG being a predict recovery from coma, they got $6.8 million from the U.S. government as an earmark back mm -hmm. when, well, that went illegal for a while and now they're doing earmarks again. So, um, uh, and that they basically got the money in order to try to wake up soldiers that were in a coma. The U.S. military has over a thousand soldiers in a coma mm -hmm. and, you know, it happens. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's war, uh, uh, you can right. roll over a Jeep and have a head injury and be in a coma even without war. Mm -hmm. So uh, we woke up 27 out of 33 that had been in a coma over a year with no response whatsoever. They were Glasgow coma scale less than eight. We woke up 27 of 33. And it's not with just neurofeedback. It's a very ugly process. I don't do it anymore. We, we showed that it could be done. Um, but, you know, a third of the people we woke up were pissed that they, they, they would have preferred passing uh, than, than recovering. And if you could look at him and say, oh, well, he's not going to be happy because he's missing both legs or he's missing an arm and a, and a leg or something. But, you know, people with a physical injury, some of them uh, just were happy to be back and their families were always happy that they were back. Some people just lost IQ points. They went from a superior IQ to a normal IQ and they continued to try and kill themselves. Mm -hmm. So you, you couldn't predict it by, and there's, how can you get informed consent? They're mm -hmm. in a coma. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ask the family to sign an informed consent, it's coercive informed consent. So you, you can't basically. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, we, we basically uh, ended up with, uh, a third of them uh, that would spit on the ground when you walk past. I mean, they were very, oh, very upset. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I stepped away from that work entirely. Uh, it, it can be done, uh, but uh, the, the ethics of it are questionable. There was only one hospital in the U.S. that would allow it to be done because of the concern of our ethics. And uh, it's in New Jersey, <laughs> Kessler uh, Hospital in New Jersey. Apparently, ethics aren't such a big deal in New Jersey. I don't know. So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the hospital allowed it and uh, uh, it was quite effective. And again, uh, 27 out of 33, that would have had essentially no chance. They say less than 10%. Well, it's way less than 10%. If you've been in a coma for a year fully uh, from trauma. Now, if you're in a coma due to uh, anoxia, uh, the same inability to recover is predictable at three months. So not everybody's coma has to wait a year uh, to end up being considered irreversible. Uh, okay. Anyway, that, yeah. that, that, that work has been done. Uh, but but, that doesn't sound like it's been done the way that she was doing it. But it's, it, it's not at all the way she was doing it. it her way was gentle uh, with feedback as opposed to uh, changing the pharmacology of the brain and then doing external uh, dramatic stimulation. Uh, mm. uh, so, uh, um, you know, it, it, it can be done, uh, but uh, her, her approach was much more gentle than the uh, very aggressive uh, uh, method. But, you know, if, you're, if it's impossible to wake somebody up according to medical uh, evaluation of them, uh, it may require a more aggressive approach, I don't know. Uh, well, it's not uh, something I work in. Anymore. It, right. Okay. But some of the cases that Margaret wrote about yeah. were cases where they didn't expect this person to wake up. Yeah. Right. So, um, but I was just, you know, what I'm interested in is not the more aggressive uh, uh, spin on the work that somebody has done, but to really to see the integrity of that work. And it doesn't sound like that has continued. Um, no. If I went into a coma, I would definitely, I mean, I would write in my consent that I would ask for this procedure, but not from what I can tell anything that you're describing yeah. that has uh, theoretically been a spinoff from it. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I've got the opposite choice for myself. I, I have a PULST EMT DNR on myself, a physician order for life sustaining technology emergency medical tech do not resuscitate. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if I go down, there's so much wrong with me already. Just, you know, let me go. So right. um, 
uh, but uh, you know, there's others. Uh, um, the the deep clinical insights that have been provided. Uh, Sue Othmer's work. That's what I. Your I'm... work, Seaburn. Uh, Margaret Errors, her her clinical insights. Uh, Elise Green's insights. The uh, the deep clinical insights that have guided the research, you know, yeah. everybody, everybody wants the research to be done and that they wait for it to be done. But the, the clinical insight precedes the research, you know, the, the, uh, right. everybody goes to the parade, not to see the people sweeping up mm-hmm. afterwards, but to, they want to see the elephants, you know, and uh, not the people sweeping up afterwards. And the researchers are, tidying up the data, organizing things. It's like the janitors after the parade, not the elephants. And the elephants in the room uh, were the clinicians that had the insights uh, to to actually guide the progress of the field. Our field was alpha and SMR, and slow cortical potentials in Europe. And that was it at the beginning. There wasn't any other kind of neurofeedback. Well, it was before it was called neurofeedback. Even. So the clinical insights that have been provided, uh, largely uh, a, a lot of the insights have been provided uh, from women in the field. Right. Again, that's, uh, what, that's what interests women, right? Yeah. That's what interests women. Yep. And that's what, why I think that it's mostly women who are reporting out the uh, clinical nuances of neurofeedback. Um, and in that process, having to dispute, we're back to this, the DSM, and looking at something that's much more primary. But I, I wanted just to talk about how, you know, when I entered the field, um, I entered it after um, training my brain. Uh, and I've said many times that I don't think that I would have gotten into it listening to a talk. I had to get into it. Uh, having the experience, and I had that experience with a, a very wonderful clinician and friend of mine, Kathy Zilberman, uh, on a Focus 1000, which was essentially the feedback was uh, a red light and a green light and a beep. Uh, no fancy games, nothing fancy. And But I did that training um, over... Um, seven uh, hours, probably more than seven hours in one weekend. And I, we didn't know this was not recommended. <laughs> and I'm not sure it should not be recommended, although I always put a caveat, as I will today, on this is not recommended to do. Uh, it's a lot of training in a very short period of time, but it led to an extraordinary aha moment for me. Once I realized what was shifting, and the shift was in a kind of what I came to call ambient fear. It just was a whole different, I lived in a different universe when that fear dropped. And this was SMR training, which I can't do. I I mean, you know, it was not an easy thing for me that I would be sort of simultaneously over aroused and this fear was dropping away. I had migraines, pressured speech. I had other problems that would come with training at 12, 15 hertz. And still to this day, need to train. And that's just the way it is. I'll have to train in alpha. All right, so my reward is in alpha. And I've tried all kinds of approaches, but my first, so when I had that experience of, of, of learning uh, in such a profound way what this could do. And I was at that point, the clinical director of a program, uh, a residential treatment program for the most severely disturbed kids in the state of Massachusetts. I said, oh my God, this has got, that I, I have to bring this into, uh, yeah. back into my program, but I have to bring it into, uh, into awareness. And I didn't know what I was saying. I mean, what that has led to is an extraordinary life. But um, in that process, I, uh, I learned, and I think it was mostly from Kathy, but um, that the training to go to was the Othmer's training. So, and I think that was right, and it was definitely right for me. I uh, was trained then by Sue Othmer, Siegfried, Barry, and Barry Sermon and Julian Isaacs, which was an incredible introduction to the field. And for the most part, I didn't understand the thing they were saying, but I just felt it would filter in somehow because this experience had been so remarkable. 
What I did recognize and what was not being talked about in general until these conversations that arose with Sue and with, with Siegfried sort of around and in it as well, was that the primary contribution of neurofeedback might very well be seen as affect regulation. That was what my experience was, you know, in broad strokes, that's the way I would, and that's been where I've been focused my attention and Sue also, their model, I don't know if it was this before this conversation around affect regulation. Remember, I remember Siegfried saying something like, oh, right, you'd have to have some way of knowing what to pay attention to. And that would be in the realm of affect. And this is just moving the conversation away from attention, which is where it was, and attention deficit into affect yeah. regulation. And then the, the model that I have found the most useful um, and the one that I have adhered to most, uh, mostly uh, it's been uh, Sue's model of, of um, regulation, affect regulation really, and, and uh, the organization of the brain. So, uh, and you know, when I look at, uh, at what is besetting us in the world, um, uh, and most prominently right now, January 6th, and then watching how these hearings are going and watching the level of arousal as, as a measure, right? I think, okay, so what, what's never being talked about as the primary problem that we're having in the world right now is, is a regulation of arousal. Right, so that that model serves widely in ways of understanding human behavior, and uh, and what we could aim for in all kinds of ways. You know, in 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 uh, uh, in school programs, in yoga, in in neurofeedback, and, and but that for me those two things have now become pretty inseparable to understand uh, affect regulation and neurofeedback as um, th that's the reason for neurofeedback. That's why it came into our lives. This is why it, I mean, you know, the, 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 not to be messianic and I do want to mention a few other people along the way. So, so there was nothing on trauma, except that then I came across an article that Nancy had written, and uh, Nancy White, and uh, and so I and Linda. They were both. It was beginning to surface, and obviously that was my. I was working with traumatized patients. I had a trauma history of my own, and what had resolved or had had eased dramatically in that seven days of training was the fear circuitry, I think the firing of fear circuitry that had overtaken me so much so that I didn't know it was there all the time, right? It was just a, a constant. Another person who uh, you will remember, I'm sure Jay, um, who was known, is known mostly for her work with peak performance was Ray Tattenbaum. Mm -hmm. Ray preceded me into this field. She was also originally um, trained by the Othmer. She ended up using NeuroOptimal, but she uh, uh, learned the arousal model at, at the beginning and she was local. She lived in Connecticut, I live in Western Massachusetts and we became friends. Um, uh, Joy Lunt was also a, a, um, uh, a, one of my teachers and, and uh, colleagues. Um, there are many, and I'm not going to remember everyone that I should remember. That's going to be the problem. But I think that the gist of this is that women have made a major contribution, and it may very well bifurcate to some extent along this notion of clinical insight. Of, of what you do, you know, where, and, and, and it has a sort of sexist implication, I guess, you know, men have gone to the technology and women have gone to the softer science of, you know, clinical nuance and how this manifests. But um, oh, Terry Kalura is in there too, you know, it's in a major influence in the field and, and, a, and, a, and a warrior to, you know, keep this thing going along with Tom. Um, many couples in this field, as you know. So, 
um, you know, I appreciate everything that I have learned from them, and I and I appreciate the particular way that uh, women's influence has been being felt. And this was not true when I started in the in the field. I mean, women's voices were not really encouraged. This soft uh, clinical stuff wasn't so interesting in uh, you know in the early conversations. But it's, it's, it's definitely, um, and they were much more male dominated. I think their field still is uh, dominated yep. by men. Um, but the, the, the clinical work coming out of the field, I think is pretty much dominated by women. And, um, uh, and there's a, a, a very important collaboration. Maybe you and I are an example of that in, our, uh, in these years. Um, you know, of collaborating, of having this conversation together, uh, and and the devotion to this field. Yeah. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, attend ANI's pre-conference workshop at the ISNR 2022 conference, Wednesday, July 27th, between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. The workshop will concentrate on assessment and protocol preparation using the Neuro Navigator and the Symptom Checklist, which includes cerebellar ROIs and uses SW Loretta for more precise targeting and cross-frequency coupling. Training will be introduced. And hey, if you want a coupon code, email Pete at Neuronoodle.com. I'll hook you up. Learn more at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash NeuroGuide. You know, the educators that were women are, are really important because they've spawned the number of students. That, it's just astounding how many students have come into the field. Uh, uh, Jeannie Boder, Bodenhammer Davis's work at uh, University of North Texas. Uh, she's retired now, but yeah, she turned out some fabulous students. Some of the leaders in the field now were her students then. And you know, I, I remember doing lectures at her at her her, her course and uh, on QEG. The uh, uh, tremendous level of of uh, high quality neuroscience being taught. Uh, uh, she turned out some again some fabulous students. Um, at, some of which have been president of the societies. So uh, Cynthia Kirsten is currently still uh, uh, turning out PhD students at Saybrook and the uh, Behavioral Medicine and Research Training Foundation with APA accredited courses. Uh, quite a few years ago, uh, the, the uh, Behavioral Medicine uh, Foundation approached me uh, because they, they were being hosted at the time in at a university in New Mexico that was supposed to be getting their uh, uh, certification as a, a credity, accredited as, a, as a, a university, but they failed in getting their accreditation. So the, the Research and Training Foundation was looking for a different university to host them as a course. They had the instructors, they had all the coursework. Uh, it, it was basically a turnkey PhD program. And, you know, the they invited me onto the board basically to find a host. And I had already done some work at Saybrook, uh, not in uh, the mind, brain, uh, body medicine kind of a thing, uh, uh, which Don Moss is running now, uh, but actually in, in uh, um, uh, uh, business uh, areas. Uh, I had gotten them a grant um, uh, uh, to do some work with a, 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 a an oil refinery, uh, I was on a, a community advisory panel at an oil refinery. Mm -hmm. So uh, th they got you know twenty five thirty thousand dollars to do a little project with the refinery. So they they knew me because I got them a grant. Mm -hmm. So I called the president, uh, the acting president, um, and asked him if I could take him out to lunch and and uh, pitch him on something. He said, "Oh, free lunch." You know so. Uh, we went uh, uh, and sat down. Uh, I handed him a spreadsheet uh, showing, you know, what you could make uh, from hosting a set of courses like this. And he looked it over and said, looks great. Um, 
uh, we'll be happy to do this for you, except we're going through our reaccreditation right now. We don't need any new programs to be reviewed. So it's going to be six months before we can accept you afterward. And they went through the Western Regional Accrediting and they were reaccredited as a, as a, a, a university. And uh, they then accepted and, and have instituted and, and have been reaccredited even using the, the uh, mind brain uh, 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 medicine stuff now. So uh, the uh, Cynthia Kersons um, uh, at the administrative level uh, at Saybrook at this point and has been doing very good work turning out some very uh, fine students, uh, seeding them into the field again. Um, it, we, we can, yeah, I grew up in Fargo, farming uh, analogies abound, you know, so uh, uh, the, the whole seeding thing, you know, um, uh, but uh, uh, the, the educators in the field have, have generated students that now are uh, at the at the head of the organizations and uh, starting to lead the field. Uh, so we have to honor the uh, the people who turned out these uh, top quality students. The uh, another woman that I'm thinking of. And this is just to uh, and for you to think more, more geographically, more broadly too. Um, is uh, our colleague in um, Australia, uh, Mariana Skovic, who has been working with, uh, I know you work closely with her. And yeah, starts. She's, she's brilliant and uh, clinically very deep in her work. And um, yeah, she's the head of STARTS, which is an organization that works with uh, war trauma, people who suffered trauma in war and uh, torture survivors, very uh, tough, um, uh, uh, at least apparently a, a very tough population. She's worked closely with Yuri uh, Kropotov on, on, and you, I think, Jay, and you could talk more about that, that level of her work. But again, she is one of the people who, who goes deeply into this work and looking at what we actually see and reporting out what we actually see in, in the way that this very, this, this simple, really simple feedback to the brain uh, opens uh, consciousness. Uh, and it really not, not, we haven't, we have not played that drum a whole lot, right? About how it really opens uh, consciousness, it's, it's, it's now the, what, what's being taken over by the psychedelics. There's always going to be a pill uh, that, that is, is going to appeal to people when they have their own conversation with their own brain opens the doors of consciousness. So anyway, Ma Mariana uh, occurs to me, and you probably could have some other people um, geographically spread out to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in, in Europe, Uta Strail, uh, who took over the uh, lab from uh, Burbomer. Yes, yes. Um, uh, the, uh, absolutely uh, brilliant. And uh, um, she kept the focus on uh, uh, slow cortical potential training and, uh, and switched from primarily a focus on epilepsy at CZ. They moved forward to FZ uh, working with attention deficit uh, issues with kids. So uh, expanding the clinical range um, uh, that Burbomer had established. So uh, yeah, I, uh, it, it's astounding. Um, uh, one of the physicians, um, uh, uh, Dinah uh, Mar Martinez, uh, who's uh, at Harvard and um, uh, Boston neurological or Boston neurofeedback or something. I can't remember the exact name of their organization, but uh, 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 she's, a, 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 she's a neurologist um, mm -hmm. and she's actually conducted her PhD dissertation on uh, SMR training and epilepsy, uh, very good solid research mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and brilliant clinician. Um, uh, obviously uh, one of the, the leads for the Mexican society at this point. Um, you know, internationally, uh, we, uh, we've actually expanded dramatically, uh, uh, in the U S a lot of people feel like the field is just not progressing. 
the, the, it's kind of uh, the, the same players in the U.S. But if you look internationally, the field's just exploding. Uh, 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 dramatic increases in the number of professionals, um, uh, the, the quality of the research. Uh, you know, look at uh, uh, Thomas Ross uh, and, and Ruth's uh, publications. The, you know, functional MRI uh, work, uh, the uh, tr tremendous uh, quality, a uh, high level uh, quality of neuroscience being applied to neurofeedback. This isn't a simple uh, slide switch of alpha going up and down. Uh, the, this, the complex neural uh, networks that are involved and everything. All of that's being teased out at a at a high level now uh, uh, by researchers. Uh, I, I have to I have to mention one person who's uh, uh, at the very beginning was a very key person uh, operating along with Camilla, uh, uh, Sonia, and Coley, uh, and and she's um, I, I, she's lost to the field. She's on to other stuff now. Uh, but at the uh, AAPB's uh, 50th annual uh, meeting, uh, she popped back in for that celebration and brought with her uh, uh, pictures with, uh, you know, Joe Camilla is a young uh, professor and, and uh, a Barry Sturman uh, still green behind the gills. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 really hilarious, uh, some of the early uh, photos from the meetings see Eric Pepper, uh, uh, a skinny, big flop mop of hair, um, yeah, uh, uh, as a very young uh, person as well. So it's, uh, she brought back a, a tremendous amount of memories from the early meetings, uh, uh, images of people like Bass Majan, who's uh, long since uh, uh, passed along. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, that the discussion of the women's impact in the field, because I think, as you've mentioned, it's undervalued uh, 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 historically, uh, uh, kind of a male dominated organizational uh, uh, structure. But uh, when you look at it, uh, uh, it with, with a little bit of detail, you actually see that uh, the, the, the women in the field end up having uh, brought us all along uh, 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 very solidly. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. And when you look now at, um, you know, again, in my area of interest in trauma, the person that's going to break this is already beginning to break this open and just bring this conversation um, uh, into uh, uh, neurosciences with Lanius. And, um, and, you know, she, she, uh, is one of the leading, if not the leading trauma researcher in the world and, uh, and published an extraordinary study. She has stories to tell about doing that study um, on, uh, on uh, Alpha Down, right? That she uh, and Thomas came up with. It's its own, that's its own story, but it is very important research and, um, and she and I talk about the implications of this research a lot. And when we think of the field, the same names, uh, maybe that's true, although I'm not even sure of that, given this show, I'm seeing some people that I've never known, uh, you know, like um, the, the uh, his name has now escaped me, of course, but the man who was talking about uh, chronic fatigue um, you know, I'm stuck away in their labs doing research, but the, but if you, it has come, it become clear to me that this field is anything but dormant. It is alive and well in the United States and, and that's on the clinical front. Yeah. Um, and as you said, the clinical results are what drive the research. If, uh, if I hadn't met Ruth Lanius and talked not about my research, but about my clinical experience, there would be no research on, or, or would have had to come from somebody else, right? And could have, um, there wouldn't be any research showing how extraordinary neurofeedback is in the treatment of uh, developmental trauma, the conditions that we yeah. all got. Um, so, um, but if you Google uh, neurofeedback in any major city, 
you're going to find neurofeedback. The quality of it, I don't know. The, we, 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 we can never know that. I can't Google a therapist in any major city or any place anywhere and know what their quality is going to be. Um, but the availability, there is increasing availability, and most of it's women. Not all of it. Not all of it. But in the clinical world, uh, this is always so, right? If you go to a social work meeting, mostly in women. If you go to a psychology meeting, gets to be, because the status is higher, it gets to be a little bit more evenly uh, um, men and women. But um, clinically, it looks to me, I don't know if this is your experience, this is not a count for sure, nothing scientific about this, which is my impression, that women are uh, adopting this more readily than men on, at the level of uh, uh, clinicians. Do you have that impression? Uh, I, I won't disagree with you. <laughs> uh, I, I would suggest that there's also one uh, person that we can point at that's kind of on the edge of neurofeedback and biofeedback, uh, Anna Weiss. Um, Anna Weiss's work was uh, biomonitoring. Uh, she was the one who looked at the data. It wasn't fed back to the patient, but mm -hmm. she used that data for guided meditation. And she had some tremendous insights that I think are kind of lost almost within the field. Uh, she would do an interview uh, before she would do any guided meditation. She would interview in a very organized interview. And one of the things she would do is have you close your eyes and imagine colors, uh, fire engine red, flame red, blood red, something red. And she would watch her EG spectrum and there would be a peak that would pop up and she would jot down what that frequency was. And she went right down Roy G. Biv, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, all, all the way down. And it actually has progressive from faster frequencies for the red to slower frequencies for the purple, going from the lower beta frequencies down to the theta range. And if she was doing a guided meditation with you and she saw a missing frequency, she would look at her notes and say, oh, I can guide orange into the meditation and boost the frequency that this person is missing right now. I so she, would, she had tremendous depth of understanding and, and, and insight that's, I think, lost to a large extent. She did a few books, uh, Peak Performance, Brain or Mind. I can't recall which one she, she used in the title, Fine. but, um, but she, she was brilliant and absolutely just a delight. Uh, when we had our offices in Corte Madera, we would, uh, she, she lived only a few blocks from the office and we would catch lunch together fairly frequently. We were old friends. And um, I, I actually saw that uh, when she was walking, uh, that she probably had a peripheral motor neuron disease. Her, it's, what, it's called clown's feet when you're walking and your heel catches and your toes flop down. Yeah. And your, your feet are spread a little bit wider apart. And classically, you can see that in alcoholism, but I knew her, she's not a chronic alcoholic. So it's peripheral motor neuron disease. And I told her, you know, uh, you, you've got clown's feet walking here with a widespread gait. You need to go see a neurologist to find out what's going on with the motor neuron system. And it was five years from then before they could identify on an MRI that she had the MS that you could see that she actually had already. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately that took her. Um, but you know, um, if you tell somebody you, you think they might have MS and it takes them five years to get diagnosed, I, I've, I've learned to kind of uh, shut up about my, uh, neurological observations, you know, um, uh, she could have had five years of, uh, not worrying about it, um, without any difficulty, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, uh, yeah, we well, live and learn. You are, we are speaking about a great loss to the field. So she yeah. was quite young and, um, and she, her, her influence was just beginning. Uh, yeah. And uh, I would very much recommend that book. In fact, I am recommending it to myself to read that again, Peak Performance Mind. Yeah. I think you're right. She had, uh, she had sort of crossover insights, right? Of, between the, the clinical, the mystical, her, her, uh, early motivation was around meditation, right? It was to help meditators fill out or, or go deeper into their meditation. When they found her MS, um, she wanted to try to have uh, uh, healing 
she went uh, back over to Tibet, where she had been 20 years prior uh, to a temple uh, that she was f- familiar with. And when she got to the temple, one of the head monks grabbed her hand, walked her into the temple all the way in. There's a wall covered with pictures of people. And he went over and pointed at a picture of her from 20 years before that and uh, uh, recognized her basically as somebody he had seen before. And, uh, and uh, she, she received a tremendous amount of relief uh, from, uh, uh, from being there and, and uh, interacting with the, uh, the, the people in Tibet. So it obviously didn't save her from the ultimate uh, end of the MS taking her, but um, yeah, some relief is better than no relief. And, and uh, her experience there was really quite profound. You know, I see a lot of the, of the inspiration in the field coming from women now as yeah. well, and uh, young women. Uh, new in the field, uh, working uh, more, much more comfortable now because of counter conditioning, I think, with technology and with the fact that these things, we can't avoid it. I mean, I would never have thought that I would be somebody who was putting sensors on somebody's head. And I mean, I, the, the, that, I, I, you know, I was one of the last adopters of the, of a computer, right? It's like, the fact that I would be now placing electrodes on someone's head is, is absurd. I, I wouldn't yeah. have even been in something that I could have thought about. So the the fact that um, uh, that there were some women that came for me and that there are a whole lot that, that I owe an enormous amount to, you know, I've mentioned, and a whole lot coming along. And yeah. in that next class, and Mariana is one of them clearly, and but yeah. there are a number of, of uh, you know, if we can just, they can get enough support and enough money and enough uh, to, to keep going um, because their contributions are enormous. Yeah. You know, Penny Jean Grace Fire, um, yeah. a brilliant uh, a clinician and uh, a software developer and hardware developer. Um, yeah. uh, Heather Hargraves with Divergence. Um, the, the, the number of young people that are coming up in the field uh, that, that are going to form the future of the field basically are really uh, uh, astounding. And uh, it's not all males. Yes. Um, Thank uh, God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now we've, we've talked, we've talked about the underrepresentation of females in the field. Uh, it's not like there aren't females in the field. It's just that they don't quite get the press coverage or attention that some of the more flamboyant guys do. But our field is also, I think, a little shy on uh, on uh, racial um, and cultural uh, uh, diversity. Uh, that that's changing as we become more international. Uh, but it's still, I think, un- underrepresented uh, when you see the meetings in the U.S. Uh, uh, it, uh, we we have a long way to go to become balanced and representative of of uh, all groups. Yes, we do. But we're trying. Thank you all for watching Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology Podcast. We'd like to thank our Patreon business supporters. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, attend ANI's pre-conference workshop at the ISNR 2022 conference Wednesday, July 27th, between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. The workshop will concentrate on assessment and protocol preparation using the Neuro Navigator and the Symptom Checklist, which includes cerebellar ROIs and uses SW Loretta for more precise targeting and cross-frequency coupling. Training will be introduced. And hey, if you want a coupon code, email Pete at NeuroNoodle.com. I'll hook you up. Learn more at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash NeuroGuide. Hey, Mary Tracy's Neurotraining Strategies offers a higher standard of EEG, QEG education to EEG clinicians, technicians, and neurofeedback practitioners with their convenient online BCIA and QEG certified didactic courses. Check them out at EEGStrategies.com. 
Hey, Mind Media's Nexus Amplifier. Hey, full disclosure, Pete's been a customer for years, but check them out. They got a semi-dry cap coming out. You can see it live at ISNR. Say hello to great connectivity and goodbye to artifacts and paste in your client's hair. Check them out at mindmedia.com. Three things our listeners can do to help us spread the word of neurofeedback. Number one, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Number two, give us a review on whatever platform you listen to. Five stars is appreciated, but Jay Gunkelman will accept four and a half. Hey, if you have the means, please support us on Patreon slash Neuronoodle. There are different levels in which you can support us, whether you're a mom or dad or a clinician. There's even an option where you can have your own Q&A with our own Jay Gunkelman. This support help, helps us improve the quality of our content. Hey, trying to get these video edits even better, even better. Again, we thank you all for watching. Cue the non-copyrighted music.